speaker, Dick Zimmer, a member of our department. Dick uh, got his bachelor's and PhD both from uh, UC Santa Barbara, just down the road, but then he left uh, for Australia and South Carolina um, and uh, Alabama as well um, before returning here um, in, two, in 1995 when he started um, his faculty position here in the department. He's also a member of the neurosciences program here at UCLA and currently a program officer at the National Science Foundation. Dick's going to tell us today about his groundbreaking work in chemical communication and navigation. Thanks, Craig. Uh, it's hard to believe that I've, I've been here now for 15 years and that I'm up for step six promotion and hence I'm, I'm giving uh, the seminar. Uh, time's gone by so quickly and in a seminar like this it's really, really tough in that do you give something that maybe has the most significance, or do you give something that's perhaps the most fun? <laughs> and so what I, I hope to show today is some of the work that I think is significant, but yet I can say has brought me the most fun since, since I've, I've come to, uh, to UCLA. So briefly, um, chemical communication plays many important roles in ecology and evolution. Certainly predators. Um, use chemical cues or signals uh, as searching for prey, but prey too will detect compounds that predators emit and exhibit some kind of alarm response. Courtship and mating, probably the most celebrated example would be those of lepidopteran butterflies and moths, uh, males searching uh, for calls that are produced by females, but also eggs uh, release compounds for many species that sperm track, and we'll be talking about this later on. Habitat colonization, again, in terrestrial environments, such organisms as pine bark beetles will uh, respond to cues uh, given off by uh, pine trees and um, uh, colonize these habitats. But marine larvae uh, will use a variety of cues to find suitable habitat uh, in their dispersal processes, very important. And, mediating community dynamics, parasite-host relations, as well as symbiotic interactions. Uh, these parasites and um, a variety of symbionts will use chemical cues in finding hosts. And finally, uh, maybe not um, communication, but, but microbes as well will search for patches of nutrients and uh, exploit then uh, these, these patches at one time or another. And the reason why I put these examples up here is uh, during the 15 years that I've been here at UCLA, I've used a suite of tools and addressed um, these problems, uh, many different kinds of problems, including these. And briefly, what I'd like to say is that if you're interested in working on the natural history or having a nice natural historical context for chemical communication, a study really needs to begin with chemistry. And in that case, the molecule, the structure, the natural product has to be identified the concentration then determined. The reason being is then you can determine what the input flux is. How much of the chemical is actually released by a signal producer into a native habitat. It's impossible to dynamically scale the stimulus unless you begin with knowledge of the structure of the signal molecule or the cue. Well, once you have that compound released into a fluid environment, air or water, then physics comes into play transport processes, the bulk flow, the movement downstream, called advection. At small scales, molecular diffusion is important. At large scales, eddy diffusion, or turbulent mixing places a role. And so it's physics then that determines where these signal molecules or cues go in time and space, and ultimately what impact they have in mediating a biological response, either a physiological or behavioral response. And my lab really addresses all three of these components. While we're most interested in the final consequences for the biology, we're also quite fond of the chemistry and physics. Uh, today, I'll just be skimming over uh, some of the chemistry that we've done and focusing uh, more tightly on the role between uh, physics and behavior. And in this case, the big biological questions that we'll be working on are how do sperm find eggs, particularly under uh, physical conditions that mimic those within natural uh, habitats, and also how do predators uh, find prey. But I think just as importantly, I draw on these two examples from our work because we've 
we've researched very different scales. With the sperm and egg, these cells, relatively speaking, move very slowly. Um, they're very, very small. And hence, in this case, uh, the fluid environment is dominated by frictional forces or viscous dominated forces that, in fact, um, tend to dampen any fluid misbehavior. In inertial dominated systems, these organisms are larger and they tend to move faster, or the fluid moves faster. And in this case, then, uh, the fluid itself is, is moved by such things as um, water moved by wind creates water circulation, air, of course. These would, the wind, then, would be an example of an object applying inertial force. And in this case, then, a turbulence, and turbulent mixing comes into play. So at the small scale, um, at least mixing plays little or no role, whereas at large scale, mixing can be quite significant. And so the question is, is what are the rules of the road under these very different physical conditions for organisms that differ quite a bit in their size and in their uh, life histories? And what I'd like to talk about first is fertilization. This is just a brief, brief quote from um, an outstanding scientist, Vic Vakia, that appeared in Science in 1998, and what he said basically was that there's very little understood about fertilization at this time, surprisingly. And what I would like to say in a 10-year sense is there has been quite a bit more um, found out about fertilization, and particularly with respect to chemical cues and recognition systems. But in this case, it's the molecular aspects. What are the signaling cascades? What happens once the sperm contacts the membrane um, of an egg. In terms of the ecology and the evolution of these signaling systems, there's still surprisingly uh, very, very little known, particularly within a well-established natural historical context. And briefly, if we look at a general scheme of animal fertilization, and this is borrowed from uh, Vic's paper, there are five different components to it. In A, what happens is that a sperm swims from some distance away and eventually uh, penetrates an egg jelly matrix that surrounds an egg. This example is drawn from an abalone, a large mollusk, but it also fits a sea urchin. And there's, it's analog, largely analogous, actually, to events that occur within humans, too. So sperm has to get from some distance point to finally making contact with the egg. And in this case, uh, the sperm head recognizes the egg envelope and then releases a protein from the acrosome vesicle. I should say a suite of proteins. One of these proteins uh, reacts with receptors on the egg and dissolves them, and therefore makes a hole so that the sperm can begin to penetrate. Finally, the membrane of the sperm recognizes the membrane of the egg. They fuse, and then the nuclear package is injected into the egg, and ultimately fusion occurs. And one thing I'd like to point out here is that each one of these processes, A through E, is mediated by a different chemical signal. Okay, so chemical communication certainly plays sudden significance in sexual reproduction. In this case, what we'll be working on is the process at A. B through E are relatively well known, and A, um, before our work, really hadn't been touched on uh, much at all. How do we get a sperm from some distance away uh, to the egg surface? And in this case, the model system that we've used or depended on is one that Vicks worked on for some time in terms of contact cues, uh, the red abalone. It's a large mollusk. It lives in kelp forests off the California coast uh, amongst rocky reefs, and they tend to live in aggregations. Here we see three abalone. Uh, the sexes are separate, but the sexes co-occur. We've done an, a really a lot of work of characterizing um, the fluid dynamic environment in these natural microhabitats where abalones live with custom-built uh, Doppler acoustic probes. And what I can tell you about these habitats is that the flow is greatly retarded. And it tends, surprisingly, to be relatively well-behaved and one-dimensional. Here we see an abalone, <coughs> OK? And you'll notice these holes. And when an abalone spawns, it spits its gametes outside of these holes. What's interesting is you see all these uh, tentacles surrounding the abalone. These are actually used in detecting uh, water motion or uh, the motion of a predator. In this case, I just have uh, an arrow that points to two cephalic tentacles that have actually been withdrawn where they would be positioned 
Those are used more in the sense of spell, uh, I mean the sense of smell, and here we see a male that has, in fact, recently spawned. There are lots of reasons for using abalone, but a couple that I'd like to say, and that is that gravid males and females can be found year-round within natural habitats. So there is, there's, while there, there is, tends to be a bit of a reproductive system, you can get gravid males and females all the time. That usually is a huge limitation in studies on fertilization. Another thing is that there are eight different abalone species that overlap uh, reproductive seasons in time and space along the west coast of North America. So ultimately, if you're interested in questions that evolve evolution of mating systems and the roles of chemical cues, you can work with many different species. In terms of doing the chemistry <laughs> of identifying the attractant, the best reason is that a male produces roughly, a single spawn from a male produces roughly uh, 10 trillion sperm, and the female will release 3 million eggs. So right away you have plenty of material uh, with which to work. Uh, what I'd like to show you is just what the spawning event looks like. This is a male. And what it will do is it will contract its foot, its muscular foot, and produce gamete jets. And both the males and females will uh, perform this behavior. What I can tell you about the female is we've done a lot of work on the material properties of the fluid in which the gametes are embedded. It's a lot more viscous. Their jets don't go out quite as far. And usually the female spawning is, um, occurs in response to uh, the male ejaculate, of which we haven't yet identified the cue. Just a little bit of chemistry. <clears throat> Surprisingly to us, uh, L-tryptophan ends up being the natural uh, egg-derived molecule that uh, acts as a sperm attractant, and we can talk about why later on in the questions if you'd like to. But briefly, how did we go about this work? We just didn't take tryptophan off the shelf. Instead, we used bioassay-guided fractionation of um, water that had been used to condition the eggs uh, working at native concentrations. In this case, we employed uh, reverse phase and size exclusion, high-performance liquid chromatography to isolate and purify and ultimately identify a single active peak that <coughs> was then identified through uh, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance um, experiments, 1D and 2D, as uh, tryptophan. Just to make sure, what we did then was we co-injected our uh, unknown, at that time, a peak, single active peak, the natural product with an L-tryptophan standard. We, st we retained the single peak, but it doubled in size, which verified, in fact, that the signal molecule was tryptophan. One thing to keep in mind is that the threshold uh, required for causing a response in a sperm cell is about 5 times 10 to the minus 9th uh, moles per liter. Tryptophan is absent from seawater. It's degraded rapidly. It auto-oxidizes. So it's actually a pretty interesting, pretty nice signal molecule. So what actually happens in nature? It's one thing to identify a compound and to work in still water, and that's always fine and dandy, but it doesn't replicate events as they occur in nature. So I'm just going to talk briefly with a couple of cartoons and show you simply what, what <coughs> characterizes um, some of these uh, flow properties. In this case, it's appropriate to say that mixing plays no role, but even at the scale of a single cell, it's inappropriate to say that turbulence doesn't matter or that turbulence doesn't have an effect on a single cell because the cell is too small. And in this case, what I've done in one, actually two dimensions here, is I've scaled the size of an egg relative to the theoretical size of the smallest eddies that we would see within the natural habitat where abalone actually spawn. Okay? And what happens is that within the eddy, the swirl, notice that the flow doesn't cross streamlines, but the, slow is the flow is moving slower towards the middle of the eddy as opposed to the outside. And this has some very significant consequences uh, for the egg. In this case now, if we were to take these velocity vectors from the eddies and just straighten them out, this is what we would find. Again, the flow field is called laminar because the flow fails to cross streamlines, okay? And it's called a shear because there's a change in velocity over a change in space. 
So the units that you'll see surprisingly for when I talk about a shear is um, its length over space divided by length. So it's, oh, I'm sorry, length over time, of course, for velocity, divided by length. That would be a spatial. So we end up with one over time. Okay, so I'll be referring to things as, for example, 0.1 per second or whatnot. But really what this equates to is um, a shear that's applied to the egg. Well, if we now look from the egg's perspective, fluid then mo is moving in opposite directions and picks up speed as uh, one uh, perspective moves further away from the egg. There's a couple of consequences of what happens. First of all, the shear causes the egg to rotate. And this actually has quite an effect on the flow field that surrounds the egg, as well as on the, the deposition and on the distribution of signal molecules within the vicinity of the egg. And what happens just in a simple cartoon is that as tryptophan in this case, or as uh, signal molecules are released from the egg, they're carried away then by the advective component of the flow as they disperse up and down and through the board through molecular diffusion. So, it's an advection diffusion process, which we, in fact, would model. So one generates, then, <coughs> these, um, these odor plumes that can be quite interesting in shape and form. And so the real question is, isn't whether <laughs> a sperm responds to some chemical that's produced by an egg, but when and where within a natural environment under quasi-realistic physical conditions does chemical communication matter. And that's really the quarry that, that, we've, that we've stocked. And I'll show you just a little bit uh, some of our experimental apparatuses. These shear flows, such as the type, the one-dimensional shears that we've um, we just cartooned, and, but are, some, are similar to those that are found within the natural spawning microhabitat of an abalone. These can be re recreated quite well in a laboratory. And basically what one does is there's a cylinder inside another cylinder. Rn would be the inside cylinder, R out would be the outside. And this blue then defines uh, seawater, and the little dots would be gametes that we've placed inside. And the cylinders then spin in an opposite direction, and you'll see why in just a couple of seconds. And what we're doing then is we're, we're imaging the behavioral interactions between individual sperm and individual eggs within a region defined by this laser sheet which is no more than one millimeter thick. The eggs are about 200 millimeters in diameter. We then use a video microscope that's hooked up. We've borrowed this from the computer chip industry. The reason being is it has a very long focal length, but yet you're able to look with very, very high magnification. So <clears throat> we can image eggs that are five millimeters away from any wall, and therefore not feeling much or any of the frictional forces associated with those walls thus reducing artifact from a distance of seven centimeters away. And in doing that, we can also image sperm with heads as small as three or four microns. So it's quite a nice setup. Uh, the video from the output of the camera goes into a computer system. We can then look at the real-time sort of analog output, if we choose to, of the past generated by the sperm. And then we have digitized images in real time uh, that project the speeds, uh, the directions, and the paths made by uh, the sperm with respect to an egg. I should say that we've also added an algorithm to this that subtracts the flow component. So we can look at, at <coughs> the displacement of the sperm um, in the presence of flow. We can also subtract out that flow, which we do in the orientation data that I'll be showing you in a few minutes. Uh, briefly then, one cylinder is moving one way, the other, the other. There's a crossover point where eggs then will ret be retained for several minutes at a time. And if you remember the last cartoon, what we're creating right there are flow fields that are very similar um, to those that are found in nature. And these then are what we're able, we're able to image. And I'll just show you one real quick. In this case, we have a scale bar of 100 microns. This now is a di distance of seven, seven centimeters. Remember, the egg is no more than 200 microns in diameter. These are 10 frames that I've laid over one over the other. This is the head of an individual sperm of about three to four microns. In this case, it's at a shear that it's slipping by the egg without being able to <coughs> orient towards it. Okay, so this is, these are the imaging capabilities that we've been able to develop. So the question is, is that we want to be able to make predictions. Well, 
what are sperm doing with respect to that chemical plume? Well, within a one-dimensional flow, we can actually model this uh, quite well, taking even egg rotation into account. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of the output for still water, top, which would be uh, diffusion alone. Shear, 0.1 per second. This is at the lower end of what would be found in a natural abalone spawning microhabitat. And in this case, this should actually read, I just changed it to um, 10 per second. And, uh, and remember, our, our concentration, our threshold is right here, sort of between the light blue and the dark blue. And actually, it's not quite perfect in this case. But this would outline where the threshold of sperm response uh, should be, theoretically, um, <clears throat> if our predictions are right. Notice that the size of the plume grows, okay? particularly along the uh, dimension of, of flow. And so in this case, um, the plume is larger. And we might expect, therefore, that shear potentially could enhance fertilization processes. But by the time, in this case, it should be 10, we get to a shear of 10 that's found in open kelp forests away from the natural abalone microhabitats. This plume has contracted immensely in size. So it's a very, very, very dynamic environment even at the scale of a single cell. Very challenging. <clears throat> so now we'll go through um, and we'll overlay some of our digital paths of sperm from experiments on the theoretically predicted distribution of uh, tryptophan <clears throat> through our numerical simulation modeling. So there we have an egg, the red egg. And in this case, uh, the blue ring will define the threshold limit of 5 nanomolar. And we have an odor plume or an active space between that rig and the egg surface. So we run an experiment, we image cells, and look what we find. Sure enough, most of those sperm within the predicted active space are, in fact, uh, orienting towards that, that egg. If we look now instead at a shear of 0.1 per second, the plume is increased in size, and the sperm are, in fact, recruiting from a much greater distance away. I should add, in every one of these examples, we've sur subtracted out the flow component. So, so this is just the behavior of the sperm alone, independent of the uh, of flow. <clears throat> As we move to one per second, this is also found within a natural habitat of abalone spawning. So you can see the size of the plume is beginning to shrink. Okay, The cells still are orienting quite well. And finally, at 10 per second, the plume has shrunk down almost to nothing. And the cells are... <clears throat> simply swimming by. Again, 0.1 and 1 would be typical of those within the abalone uh, natural microhabitat. So now, <clears throat> the axes, what we'll be doing, I'm just going to put up my first one, first bar here, show you just a little bit of data. And this now would be what cells are doing within our hypothesized tryptophan plume. <clears throat> and I've chosen to use a mean vector length. And what, this is a unit vector that scales from 0 to 1, where if all cells are moving in exactly the same direction. The vector length is 1. If none of the cells are moving in the same direction, if they're all moving at random with respect to one another, we would then get something um, of 0 or very close to 0. So in the absence of fluid motion within the predicted tryptophan plume, many of the cells are, in fact, moving towards the egg surface. What the 12 degrees mean is that I've drawn a tangent between the head of the sperm and the center of the egg. So one would predict zero degrees if, in fact, that population of sperm on average is moving directly towards the egg surface. In this case, 12 degrees is pretty darn close. And if I was to put a variance on that, it would cover the origin of zero degrees. And so the sperm are actually performing quite well. What happens now is that when we <coughs> introduce a, a very low shear, almost all the cells, even more within that tryptophan plume, are orienting towards the egg. So there's a bump up in the navigational um, ability of the sperm at this low shear. As we start to increase shear, 0.5, it knocks off a little bit. As we get to 1, it's more, and 2, and 4, and 10. You can see that there actually seems to be an inhibition as shear increases, in this case, beyond that found within the natural habitat. And there are good physical reasons for that, and again, I'd love to talk about it in questions at the end if you're curious. <clears throat>
So one thing that, that we can do, the beauty of this, <coughs> is we can estimate the torque that's generated in turning by an individual sperm cell that it can impose on the fluid in motion. But we can also calculate the torque that's generated by the fluid that would act on the sperm. So as long as the torque generated by a cell is greater than that generated by the fluid, behavior can make, theoretically, a difference. And one thing that I'd like to show is right where we, our calculated threshold is, where the swimming is greater than shear on the other right side, less than shear, you notice that's where everything's happening in terms of behavior. And so this, I think, is a pretty amazing congruence to me of our theoretical and our empirical data. Just to overlay the shears that actually occur within the abalone microhabitat, it's clear to see that the cells perform especially well okay, uh, in response to, these, to this range of shears. And to me, it, it, so it suggests that physics may be acting as a strong selective force on the um, performance abilities of these single cells. All right, now the question is, well, okay, what's due to the physics, right, and what's due to the behavior, and what's due to the chemistry? Well, the neat thing about tryptophan now is the first experiment is where we've added eggs alone. The second experiment, we've added an enzyme that rapidly degrades tryptophan immediately upon release from the egg. And this enzyme, we've performed controls that I'm not going to show, has absolutely no effect on the behavior of the sperm or on the fertilizability of the eggs or on the sperm. Okay? So when we add this enzyme and we extinguish that tryptophan signal, you notice that there is a very significant loss in the relative orientation uh, to the egg. And I could follow this all the way through to sperm egg encounter rates and to fertilization success. And we'd see that there was, in fact, a major impact. <laughs> Now, the, the control besides uh, applying our egg plus enzyme will be what happens outside the tryptophan plume. Well, if our physics is right and our numerical simulations of those plumes are correct, then we would expect that there would be no um, significant orientation towards the egg outside of the hypothesized plumes. And we would also predict that the behavior of the cells, egg alone or egg and enzyme, should be the same. And I think, as you can see, it's a pretty striking agreement um, between what we would predict. And so I think that, that both of these uh, figures combined give us a lot of confidence that the physical models that we've developed adequately describe the behavioral consequences and output. And what's important, therefore, is that low shear uh, promotes sperm chemo attraction, but high shear inhibits. So now that we've sort of worked on some of the mechanics, I don't have enough time to talk about search and find behavior in sperm. They have some really amazing behavior in mechanics, um, again, that we could talk about later. But instead, what I'd like to talk about is the relative importance of the behavior in terms of the ecology of the animal. Does it make a difference? And so our, our experiments performed in flow, what I can tell you is we perform these um, trials under a number of different physical conditions. And if we look at the relative strength of the attraction of sperm um, to the eggs, and we relate that to the gamete encounter rate, there's a very, very high correlation coefficient. If we then relate the encounter rate to fertilization success by fusion and the growth of a zygote and then an embryo, there's extremely high correlation. And hence, one can explain well over 70 percent um, in our experiments under these control conditions of fertilization success by the chemically mediated behavior of those cells. So there's no doubt that this plays a very significant role. Again, just to remind what are the effects of flow, <clears throat> low shears conspire with behavior, but high shears appear to constrain. All right, well, let's switch gears now and start talking about big things. And in this case, <clears throat> uh, how predators find their prey, what are the rules of the road? <clears throat> and uh, the players, the first one is a predator, in this case, a blue crab. Uh, the field work we did was performed in marshes off of the coast of um, 
uh, South Carolina. Blue crab is known as an invertebrate shark for many reasons. <laughs> Don't put your hand in a tank. <laughs> they can swim. They're called the swimming crabs. And they will, they will, they will give you a, a pinch. Uh, but they eat almost anything. And more importantly, as an ecologist, though, is there have been years and years and years of um, field work that has demonstrated that a blue crab predation can, in fact, regulate both the population of select prey species as well as uh, community dynamics. So they're a good organism to work on both, I think, from a <coughs> mechanism point of view, the individual point of view, and with respect to the ecological relevance. In this case, <coughs> investigating the, the, uh, in the interaction between a crab and a clam. And again, the, this clam, the hard clam, has been selected because it's very, very common, very abundant in southeastern estuaries. It's been shown in a number of studies the crabs can, under certain circumstances, uh, determine the population densities of these clams. And the one thing that I'd like to point out, in this case, they take in water, uh, they gather food and oxygen from that, and then they, that's called an in-current, and then they expel water in an ex-current, and in this case, uh, they elicit or they <coughs> release a tiny, tiny little peptides, just chains of two or three amino acids on which we've worked that are, in fact, um, attractants to these blue crabs. I think one thing to keep in mind, do these clams choose to make these peptides to attract the, the crabs? The answer is no. But it's a constraint that's imposed simply by an organism, the clam, that has to feed. And so these are products of um, incomplete digestion that just happen to get released. Okay. So the habitat where we've done our field work, again, it's just a beautiful uh, uh, marsh in South Carolina, literally as far as the eye can see, undisturbed uh, <coughs> grass uh, habitats. And also the nice thing about it is it's a preserve, so you can put out arrays of current meters, hundreds of thousands of dollars of instrumentation and don't have to worry about it getting stolen. Okay. And here we've, unlike Bodega. <laughs> <laughs> and so here, uh, what, what we've tended to do is work mostly um, on the slack tides because the water's um, rather muddy on the flood tides. And one thing that I'd like to tell you is that we spent a lot of time, again, in characterizing the physics of these flow environments, but I'm not going to talk much about that, other than to define them as their depth-limited, hydrodynamically uh, smooth flow. And um, what this means is that they're characterized by low shear velocities denoted by a U star and by low roughness Reynolds numbers <coughs> in turn. Um, in this case, because it's depth limited, uh, what happens is that uh, the turbulent eddies that are generated by the flowing water tend to have length scales that are very, very small. And consequently, they're not very energetic. And what happens then is a shear velocity um, is a measurement of the stress applied by these turbulent eddies to the bed. The shear velocity is also proportional to the turbulent mixing coefficient. So it's a good thing to measure in, addi in addition to the advective flow speed. What's important about the roughness Reynolds number is if something is smooth, has a smooth flow, in this case less than about five, that means that right next to the bed there's a quasi-laminar flow, all right? that occasionally gets interrupted by turbulence. But it creates sort of a sheet of chemical or a sheet of scent, potentially, that can move um, downstream. Then there are turbulent eddies increasingly energetic above this, this relatively thin layer towards the bed. And we can see that here in that what we get, okay, in this case, we're filming from the top. Uh, each one of these breaks is a half meter, so this is about a five meter uh, stand. We have a tower here with a video camera looking down, and we're, we're inputting two different chemical sources. In this case, one of these would be a control plume with just fluorescein dye alone. Another would have the uh, peptide cues uh, that we're releasing, and we hope then to attract some crabs. So what's, I think, important about these experiments is that they're performed without ever manipulating, without ever touching or handling or doing anything to the crabs that happen upon this uh, this habitat. They're completely undisturbed. <clears throat> and here we see now an experiment or result where 
our control plume, and then our test plume, and you can see that a blue crab is, in fact, tracking upstream. And these crabs really are amazing navigators in these hydraulically smooth flows. And just to show you what uh, these tracks look like, <coughs> here in a flow speed, a vector flow speed of about 4 centimeters a second, 10 and <coughs> 25, as the crabs will contact the plume up to a distance, in this case, of about 3 meters away. They'll then turn upstream, all right, and they'll move immediately. They always move upstream. And as they contact the side and put part of their body out, they then move towards the midline. And they make these correcting, uh, these correcting um, uh, paths as they move up uh, towards the source. So the question is, what information are they using, both as they move upstream and as they make these correcting movements? Well, just to define a little bit more, where do crabs spend most of their time? Well, they spend almost all their time either inside or on the edge of the plume. And once they contact uh, these active spaces, very rarely do they make the wrong decision and lose the track. The time constant on which crabs are operating, their, their sensors function, olfactory receptors function at about, respond at about 10 times per second. But it looks like behavioral decisions as they start to exit a plume and then re-enter and move upstream are on about a one second time constant. Now this is important because there's sort of a traditional way to model odor plumes such as smokestacks and whatnot um, that require time averaging of several minutes. And so none of these modeling techniques were available and so we had to develop empirical methods for being, being able to characterize these chemical plumes on time and space scales that the sensors and the behaviors of crabs are actually made. And so we uh, got into doing some real-time uh, electrochemistry. In this case, we used a series of microelectrodes. These could respond up to 100 times a second, although we'd usually use them in a mode of 10, and we could make the sensor tip as small as 10 microns, although usually we would work again with ones about 100 microns to mimic the size of the innervated olfactory hair of an organism like a crab. Just to show you a little bit about the chemistry that we were doing in real time, we would coat the tip of a carbon fiber um, electrode with an enzyme that was specific and selective for oxidizing dopamine. Dopamine was our chemical tracer in this point. It's true, dopamine is not the natural attractant, but its charge and its um, molecular weight is very, very similar to what we know about those signal peptides. So on this electrode tip, dopamine contacts, <clears throat> it then is oxidized to a quinone, gives up a couple of electrons, which are eventually then um, <clears throat> create a current on the fiber tip. Uh, we amplify the signal, convert it to a voltage, and then record it to a computer disk. And here just shows one of our field deployments, <clears throat> and we can put down uh, multiple uh, probes, multiple sensors at a given time. We're setting it up. We'll move all this junk up um, onto the stream bank once we're completely set. And so what kind of output do we get from this? Okay, we're going to start over here on the left side. <laughs> start easy and, and get a little bit more difficult through time. And here what we've done is we've characterized different parts of our uh, plume at five centimeters downstream of the source of chemical release, five centimeters, 25 centimeters, and 50 centimeters. And what we've done is we've released fluorescein dye, a visual, tr a visual tracer, at the same time we've released a dopamine in a single solution. So this next <coughs> uh, part of the figure, in this case the gray shows the visible outline of the odor plume. And these histograms show the concentration of fluorescein where we've taken samples continuously over one minute intervals. And the reason for doing this is we wanted to see if the modeling of our plume over a time averaged uh, period would agree what's classically been done in research on other types of chemical plumes such as smokestacks and things like that. And what I can tell you is that as you move from 5 centimeters to 25, you can see you're getting a nice Gaussian um, dispersion or basically a normal, a normal curve for you statisticians. And if you look at the, um, the variance of the distribution of fluorescein in space, how that changes through time, then that 
provides us with an estimate of the turbulent or the eddy mixing coefficient. All right, so and I might say that, that the shape of these distributions as one moved downstream, or if one looked at the exponential decay at the center line through time, ended up fitting a Gaussian plume model beautifully, a something, a depth limited smokestack or something like that. So we're actually looking at an example that's very typical to what one might see on land, but we're doing this in water. Now finally, these last traces, all this junk going up and down, would be um, input from our chemical sensors that are taking data at 10 hertz. And here's a way to read these. So here we have a five centimeters downstream and right at the center midline, zero centimeters. And we have a given concentration that fluctuates through time. What's important here is even as we move from uh, the midline to one centimeter off the side, we go from a fairly strong signal to one where there's essentially nothing. So there seems to be a fairly strong gradient laterally. If we look now at 25 centimeters, all right, the plume midline, that's this one on the left, two centimeters distance, okay, not much difference, but between two and four, again, okay, we see then a strong edge. One thing that I'd like to point out is that while we see a strong edge laterally, we don't see a strong edge upstream and downstream, okay? So from this, one might reason that a crab could use chemotaxis Right, as it gets to the edge of the plume and making a correcting movement. But that chemotaxis won't be very valuable in moving up and downstream. So it needs another uh, guidepost to which respond, and I'll tell you right now that the crab ultimately responds not to a chemical concentration <coughs> gradient and moving up or downstream, but rather to flow direction. And then we could go on to 50 centimeters, but the... Um, the explanation's the same. And what I'd like to do now is just show you, for, let's say, a crab that places its sensors, which are on the legs, four centimeters apart. Each one of these is actually four centimeters apart, but the scales are different. You can see that if it is along the edge, it can easily place some of its sensors within a chemical-laden plume and others in a pure water. So this then gave us some um, insights into proposing mechanisms, <coughs> coming then back into the lab <coughs> and doing experiments in a large flume, or we can scale the flows within this flume to recreate many of the critical properties that are found <coughs> within these natural habitats where blue crabs actually live. So we'll put in the crabs. In this case, we have an odor source, which would be our drip bottle. We have our source of odor that, that mimics a clam siphon on a track so we can move it, and try and fool the crab and do some, some fun stuff. We have a video camera, <coughs> and this room, though, this is an IR sensitive video camera, it's completely dark. So we can put a crab in, it naturally forages at night, and it doesn't know that anything's around. And we can completely control our experiment uh, from outside. Now what's, what's fun is that we then put, we put a little Velcro sheet on the back of a crab, and we built a little battery pack with three infrared LEDs. One at the point and two on the side. So on the back of that crab we have an arrowhead. So you can not only tell where it's tracking or how fast, but what direction it's moving as well. Okay? And all this, again, they put in the crab. The crab doesn't know what's going on. So an experiment, straight and curved plume experiments. In this case, we put the crab in the odor source, which would be the natural peptides that are released from the clam, and we see what it did. Each of these tracks is um, a meter in length, and 12 out of the 15 animals that we tested um, immediately ran upstream, right? <clears throat> now what happens? If, let's say, we get the crab moving upstream, does it then track laterally, <clears throat> in this case, using chemotaxis, or does it not follow the plume and it then chooses just to continue on straight by moving with respect to the direction of flow or rheotaxis? And what, again, I can tell you is that in 12 out of the 15 cases, the crab tracked right with our movement and therefore um, appears to use the chemical gradient along the edge of that plume in responding. <clears throat> and so to sort of summarize a model on what crabs do is when a cue's present, the crabs move upstream. So it's not a chemical gradient that causes a crab or provides information on direction for the crab, but all a chemical does initially is it tells the crab, turn and move into flow. That's it. 
But what happens in this case, as it partially exits that plume, it then receives information and, uh, along the chemical gradient, and then it contracts back to the middle. And what I've drawn here is sort of a corridor of odor, which um, uh, somewhat realistically uh, demonstrates the viscous uh, sublayer component of that boundary layer in a depth-limited, hydraulically smooth flow. There's a nice corridor of odor that occasionally gets broken up by bursts of uh, turbulent, um, <coughs> turbulent mixing. So reataxis directs orientation upstream, chemotaxis directs orientation across stream. And this is very different than what's been found for um, other animals. In fact, the only one that has been looked at um, with definition with respect to um, fluid dynamics are moths in air. And as one might expect, things happen much more quickly. Uh, shear velocities, turbulent mixing is much higher, and so Reynolds, roughness Reynolds numbers are very high, and we're now within a hydraulically rough flow where this corridor of odor along the bottom has become nothing but a bunch of randomly distributed filaments. And in this case now, something like an insect <coughs> moves upwind when a cue is present. Okay? It will then continue to move upwind as long as within about 300 milliseconds it contacts another filament, then it moves upstream, contacts another filament, and continues. If it loses contact with these filaments, though, after about a third of a second, an insect will start to track from side to side. Okay? In this case, it's called casting. And so there's sort of a cast and surge behavior where insects, whether they're moving side to side or upstream, downstream, are always moving with respect to the direction of flow. There is no such thing as chemotaxis because there is no well-defined chemical gradient of any type. So the question then is, what happens with the crab? Is the crab supposing that we change the initial boundary physical conditions, and rather than putting it in a hydraulically smooth flow, we now change things and put it in a hydraulically rough flow? Does it orient as a crab? Is there something significant about being a crab? Or does it switch and use the algorithm of a moth? I'm not going to show any data, but I will tell you <laughs> that what the crabs do is they switch and they follow the, or the um, algorithm of a dog. And so in this case, I mean of a, of a moth. But a moth, well, a moth does what a dog does, what a human does, what a fish does, what a crab does. Being big, moving relatively fast, or having fluid moving fast, and uh, moving such that turbulent mixing tends to dominate other aspects of the physical signal. I'd just like to show you the output from just one experiment that we did. In this case, <coughs> we again got a crab okay, moving upstream. All right? Then we stopped the, stopped the input. And we were wondering, would they just go downstream? Would they start to cast like a moth? What would their behavior be like? What I can tell you is that in most cases, okay, this, this faint line is the track of the crab when the plume is on. The dark line is the track of the crab when the um, uh, chemical input has been turned off. And in most cases, what the crab would do is something like this. It would begin to track from side to side, and then it would track side to side and move downstream. And the sort of side to side casting, where an animal then sequentially not finding the chemical source moves downstream is exactly the algorithm that's used by a moth. Okay. Matter of fact, I could overlay a moth track and say, okay, crab or moth, and you go, huh, <laughs> I can't do it. So um, it's really pretty phenomenal. So there appears to be a very limited number of algorithms that are used by animals in turbulent flow in finding um, a source by, uh, through a chemical signal. Now, briefly then, again, bringing it back to ecology, uh, what I'd like to show just is that in the absence of flow, a crab, the search is very, ineffect very ineffective, and these crabs will find uh, prey very, very rarely. And it doesn't matter if we do these experiments out in the field or back in our flume. Okay? So no flow, remember, there's no signpost to guide that upstream component of the navigational behavior of a crab. If we look now under the rough turbulent conditions, I that defined by an insect, crabs will do it, and they will get to the source sometimes, but the search is relatively inefficient. Remember, they're going to 
They're going to hit a filament of odor and they'll burst upstream. Okay, then they'll lose contact. They'll tack from side to side for a while. They'll hit a filament again. They'll move upstream. And consequently, the likelihood of that crab finding a prey um, decays significantly. If we look now at a smooth turbulent flow where there's that information highway to quote Al Gore <laughs> with respect to the internet, uh, which of course he invented before um, he began working on global warming, um, the search is very, very efficient and very, very effective. Uh, they find the prey quite often. And I think what's so interesting about this are two things. One, we can actually define quite well the precise properties of the physics of water flow uh, when and where within natural habitats think populations of clams should be greatly or greatest exposed to predation. Also, I should say that the, if you look at a habitat, when are crabs out searching for prey? They're mostly out searching for prey during periods when there's a smooth, <coughs> uh, turbulent, hydraulically uh, boundary layer. And finally, now coming back to sperm, and this is what's so exciting to us, it just doesn't seem to matter whether it's a single cell in a viscous-dominated environment or a large animal in an inertial-dominated environment that low shear promotes, in this case, crab predatory search, but remember that low shear on a small scale also um, promotes uh, sperm chemoattraction. In this case, no flow, but in particular, high shear inhibits uh, such search and predation. And in fact, on a different scale, this is very much the same situation for a sperm searching for an egg. And so with that, I'll thank you for your time and say thanks to former graduate students and colleagues, uh, Jeff Riffle, Pat Krug, who are here at UCLA, Vic Bakie, Mike Latz, Paul Dayton at Scripps, Dean Penchef, uh, Dave Welling, Chris Finelli at University of South Carolina, uh, Ken Brown and Greg Gerhardt were here at UCLA. I put Cheryl Ann's name in the middle because she worked on both projects. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Dan. There's actually clams do lots of things in that they will tend to hang out in environments where um, periods of um, low flow are minimized. But also, as you might expect, during periods when flow is right for crab to track, they'll close up. And they may not uh, release any attractant at all. So they do have um, uh, abilities to sort of counteract the uh, predation. Welcome. One of the things that strikes me about yeah. the, the, the fact that you've got a uniformity here in terms yeah. of the search behavior and so on. Right. Is that for the sperm, the sperm is, is tiny, and the sperm presumably does not affect the flow around itself to any significant extent. Whereas these crabs are large, complicated objects, and they've got boundary layers, and, and they almost, and, and, there, and there probably is a scaling effect in terms of the size of the crab as well. And do, so, do you see things like that? Does that make a difference? So. Is your question, though, do crabs of different size yeah. use? It's the same sort of thing. They'll, they'll use the same. Or they'll, <sighs> crabs that are smaller, OK, seem to do better in flows that are more energetic than crabs that are large. And the reason being because they're able to stay hunkered down closer to the bottom where most of the signal makes a difference. The other thing, though, is that. Um, overall drag is reduced. And so there's sort of an energetic reward as well as a signal reward with uh, these smaller crabs. I should say, too, that what crabs do, if you ever watch them, in slow flow, you'll watch a crab, and they'll freely move, walk upstream with their, cloud, crabs, their claws in front. But as you begin to increase flow okay, from one regime to the next, they no longer they move sideways. And, they just, and again, the purpose of doing that is that decreases the coefficient of drag, and hence it's more energetically. Um, it's better when 
more efficient. Yeah. They can follow a plume well sideways. Yeah, they'll still exit sometimes and, and come back in. But what the real difficulty for a crab, though, once it turns sideways, is that it has a hard time contacting a plume because then it tends to move upstream or downstream naturally, okay, rather than walking from side to side. Okay. So the initial contact probability decays significantly as the flow conditions become more strenuous. Yeah, I know. It's based on the physics, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but you've got different nervous systems, obviously, in, in different animals. And now, are we talking saying, about big things, small things, yeah. or things in general? Or big things in general? What you said, a dog? Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Yep. Crabs are yep. a similar sort of yep. thing. Moths are the same. Yep. Sort That's of right. Thing. These nervous systems are built differently. So is there something, even though there's a lot of variation in terms of the structure of the nervous systems, are there internal connections? I mean, is there something about control and, and detection within the central nervous system and information processing that, that's uniform in all of these things? I think the, the short answer is, is that's true. I think that, that the problem is so difficult to solve that these animals use very simple rules of thumb. And rather than investing huge neural components of the central nervous system to sort out, oh, I'm getting hit here on whatever average they're doing a little bit more than there or whatever, that, that processing is just too much. And so what happens is I think that uh, there's very little neural investment potentially in the um, uh, mediating the response to these, uh, these turbulent chemical plumes. That, that organisms with brains the size of a human and organisms with the, the brain the size of a pea <laughs> are smaller, like a lobster or crab, seem to use exactly the same um, rules of thumb. Now, one thing that I'd, I'd say here, too, is that the, uh, while the, the, the principal code remains the same, some of the timing doesn't. Things that are more sluggish, okay, like a sea star or something like that, they'll tend to average the signal more over time because they have that luxury. Something that's a rapid responder, like a crab or a moth, okay, have to respond more quickly. Something like a moth that flies in air, okay, its receptors operate, <coughs> its input from receptor cells are about three to five times faster than that of a crab. So I think in terms of, of sort of the qualitative description of the, um, the algorithm, doesn't change. Quantitatively, the time constants and some of the space constants and actually watching what the organism does will vary depending on the particular challenge that it faces. But I really think that the problem is just so difficult <laughs> that rather than in putting in tremendous neural investment that these organisms do it as simply as possible and do quite well. Grant. Sure. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. So abalone tend to time their release on nights that have no moon, so there's no light for fish and whatnot to feed on their gametes, but also at either peak flood or peak slack tide when there's uh, minimal uh, flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, really amazing. And if you've no one particularly read abalone, I don't know about other species, they live way down in crevices. And uh, very, very, the uh, flow speed and turbulence is greatly retarded. Just thank you again. Sure. My pleasure. <laughs>